vision this day and age to read any good news on the newspaper page and love and tradition of the grand design some people say it's even harder to find Let's get started guys. It is Tuesday, almost the middle of March. I am fired up today for a couple of reasons. One, inventory is up. We are at a whopping 525 single family homes for all of Santa Clara County. That's up about 10%, right JD? Absolutely. Fantastic. We got, we got 50 more homes this week. Uh, pendings are you know, about equal, which means we have about a month's worth of inventory. Condos and townhomes are sitting just under 300. Um, but I wanted to give you guys a special shout out. Uh, we had our office sales meeting today. We have about 230, 40, 50 agents in our office. Last week, our office did 17 transactions, and our little team accounted for seven of those 17 transactions. Raise your hand if you sold a house this week. We all did. All right. Mark did. <laughs> Mark, Mark did as well. Mark, Mark's not here today, but no. But I mean, that just speaks to how hard you guys are working uh, for us as a team, but also for your clients. So. You know, when there's only 500 homes on the market, mm -hmm. you know, we're closing, you know, four to seven a week. Uh, it really just speaks to, you know, how, uh, how well we're working and operating as a team. So good job guys for that. Moving right along, save the dates, February, 2026. Do you guys know what's happening in February, 2026? That threw me off right there. I thought you were gonna give us something else. A new election. Uh, no, the election isn't no. this year. This year. Oh. Uh, I'll give you a clue. Clue. What happens February of every year? Valentine's Taxes. Day. Uh, no. Yes, but not right. Leap year. Like every four years. I don't know. <laughs> can you give us a better hint? Yeah, can okay. you please? Warmer, what colder? sports related activity Spring happens training. in February of Super Bowl? Super Bowl. Super Bowl. Yeah. What's happening in 2026 in February? Not, where's, the, where's the Super oh, Bowl? It's here. Uh, it's here. You're giving us Yes. Tickets. We're going to the Super Bowl, boys. Let's go. Let's go. You're giving us tickets. As long as the Niners or the Cowboys are in the Super Bowl, we are going. One or the other. Oh, Note God. that on the podcast as today's You day. also owe us Mexico. Yeah, well, take that up with Mark. He's Mr. Mexico. <laughs> He's I'm awesome. Mr. Super Bowl. All right. Uh, but quick question about that. So knowing, so this is interesting. Last time the Super Bowl was at Levi, uh, Santa Clara was not happy because the majority of the events happened in San Francisco. So they're working really hard to push it back um, to where most of the events are happening in the Santa Clara area. So for those of you people that have rental properties or nice homes that you want to rent out, might be a nice little Airbnb play around Super Bowl week. You can rent out your home for the amount of a ticket that it's going to cost to go to that Super Bowl. So oh, think yeah, about sure. that. Oh, <laughs> you get ready for that. What yeah. my house will rent for? Yeah. Or you can walk Tara's to the Levi's separate. Stadium from my house. So there you go. Uh, I might just move out for that What's week somewhere. No, but seriously, I <laughs> mean, last year was like twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, it's insane, right? Didn't Rihanna rent out a house yeah. this, uh, last year for some crazy amount, twenty grand a day mm -hmm. or something like that? So I think that'll be interesting if you guys own property around Santa Clara. Um, I think it'll be in even more demand in 2026 than it was last Super Bowl. Great clip. Okay, save the date. May of 2037. Olympics. <laughs> no. <laughs> just, just to educate some of you, uh, elections, leap year, and Olympics all happen on even years. So keep that in mind. And leap year and election year happen on the same set of four years. But no, so neither of that. So not a sport. May event. 2037. They fill in the Sona Lake. <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> so, you know, that's what, 13 years from now? Um, according to government officials, that's when we will actually see the completion of BART into downtown <laughs> San Jose. I was just driving to Livermore today and I was thinking to myself, how. First of all, we, you saw the article that came out that said BART is going to cost an additional like 600, eight, million. 600 million. At what point when they built this thing did they think, oh, let's just not connect all the way around the bay? And do you know what the total estimated project cost is it's now? It's like four point, no, it's like five billion now. $12.75 billion. Can you remind me, is the is, is it BART or VA that they're making it go underneath the ground? That's BART if they're oh. able to still do it. Now there's talks they might not be able to. So, you know, and, and when you think about what it costs to ride BART, how are they Have ever? you ever been on BART? Yes. Have you? Yes. Have you? No. I've never. Oakland A's games. Actually, like maybe I did <laughs> once to go to the A's game. Yeah. But that's it. 
Yep. Yeah. But right. I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll help reduce traffic. And Where's the closest oh. station? No one's going to ride it. Well, right now, the closest station is Berryessa. So it's and a, they wanted to go barrier yeah, so to down. downtown San Jose, so that it connects to where like the that's, Caltrain that's station is. That's what they're saying. Is. They're going to stick it underground. Is right underneath the sat the East Santa Clara Street. Yeah. Oh Center or yeah, sure. Stick it underground. No chance. Yeah. So anyway, all we have to wait is thirteen Dude, more years to see started. what happens. Yeah, they're digging underground. They they the hole. Yeah, there. just like they started for the high speed light rail to South Southern California. They're they actually should, still working on that. They should introduce the Hyperloop. You can get from San Jose to San Francisco if installed uh, within 45 minutes. Like, actually, not 45 minutes, sorry, 10 minutes. If installed. It's, if installed. If Take installed. Me on cool. They're Musk's doing one right now worth. from Dubai to Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. which uh, initially, like, oh, on the road, will take you an hour or something. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get from Dubai to Abu Dhabi in, like, less than 10 minutes with the Hyperloop. It's wow. insane. We're busy funding other things. <laughs> yeah, Bart and the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah. All right. So hey, can we talk about Super Bowl for a second? The, I, the one that the Niners lost? Or the just one Super Bowl in general? Super Bowl in general. Okay. I believe over the last <laughs> 10 years, mm -hmm. since Levi's was built, Santa Clara has done a very bad job at bringing things to the stadium. And they're working on it now. Yes. But it's almost too little too late. Because... In 2026, that whole area across the street is still not going to be done where the golf course was. And mm -hmm. they're going to dump out at Super Bowl and you're going to go to Denny's. That yeah. seriously is your only option. Or the or, Hilton. Or, or you can go across the street to In-N-Out and get stabbed. Stabbed? Yeah, there was a stabbing at the In-N-Out there across oh, the street. See, there's, uh, if I was the NFL, I would still host everything pretty much in San Francisco. Yeah, or i just have mm -hmm. every Super Bowl every year in Vegas. Yeah. Vegas or Miami, yeah. right? I mean, That's does it. anybody want to go anywhere else? I went to the Miami else? one. Awesome. Yeah. Vegas one didn't go to, but... But I heard also. nothing but great things. Mm -hmm. So the only thing with uh, Vegas is that that's actually the smallest stadium in terms of um, seats. available seats. Yeah. So and that's another reason why tickets were so high. But what what the Super Bowl brings to the cities oh, is so much. The right? amount of revenue? Yeah. Absolutely. Just, like, look how many people went to watch parties in Vegas. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> disappointing. <coughs> just like my Cowboys. <coughs> All right, moving on. It's got a nice little... Joe Biden's done it again. We love her. Him. 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 He. They. He. <laughs> they. He. Him. Yeah. Joe Biden's done it again. Um, they are trying... The current administration is trying to find ways to... To build a ramp instead of stairs? Yes, for Air Force One. <laughs> And in addition oh. to that, <laughs> it's actually just an escalator. So you stand on it, and then it just takes you up there. Bringing uh -huh. up the vegetable. <laughs> well, that's our president. Sorry about that. Don't, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Big Biden guy. No, I'm just, I respect the I respect the. Oh, I have no president. respect for him. I, I respect you the love Kamala. I respect yeah. the position of the president. I used to. We get another save the date on this one? All right. No, you don't get to save the date. But uh, Biden, the Biden administration has unveiled a, uh, unveiled a plan to try to generate uh, more homes for sale to incentivize home buyers to buy. Uh, and then, obviously, there's a big push for affordable housing. So two things they're doing. One, they want to give uh, middle-income and lower-income home buyers a $10,000 tax credit when they purchase a home over the course of two years. So that equates to about $400 per month. And they believe that a $400 a month tax credit uh, will increase home ownership um, by about 3.5 million home buyers. What do you guys think about that? Well, I think for middle America, it's great. It doesn't do anything here. Yeah, unfortunately. It's just a drop in the bucket the, yeah. for the mortgage amount here. But mm -hmm. but elsewhere where prices are low, I mean, it'll make a significant But impact. it makes me happy to see people, say, in North Dakota, being yeah. able to buy instead of rent, right? No, yeah. Here, it's... Yeah, that's not even 2% yeah, of I think it's great. Payment. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really affect us. And but. then likewise, they're trying to get sellers uh, incentivized to move. So kind of same thing, you know, um, middle income, lower to middle income. Home sellers, they will give them a $10,000 tax credit um, over two years to sell. So if there was a capital gains, they instead of maybe getting 250 or 500, they get an extra $10,000 credit on top of that. I don't particularly think that moves the, the needle as much as maybe the home buyer credit will. Mm -hmm. But point is, they understand that there's a tightness of inventory and because of high interest rates, you know, affordability is, is out of reach for a lot of folks. So 
It's, and who, but obviously Joe Biden is the face of it, but who helps him with these decisions? Like the like who's the puppet master? No, like <laughs> is it a team of people who analyze sure, the economy? His, his, his economic, economic advisors, yeah. right? But three million people is a lot. Yeah, no. It, I mean, that's it, good. It is. Do you think that's good? Yeah, that's yeah like I mean, it's, it's great. I think anything little helps at all point. Like you okay. said, it's like... But more than anything, it just helps getting your foot in the door, right? Yeah. So Correct. You can build it's other company. people that may have never even thought about mm-hmm. it that gets them start to have that conversation or explore that, that idea. Side note, that California Dream Home is back. Yeah, it'll be back for a little bit. And if anybody has taken advantage of that California Dream Home Act, we'd love to hear from you because I've, I've yet to meet a so person. I sold new. someone a house from it. Yeah. I was the listing agent, though. But mm-hmm. I have a friend uh, who's represented, like, I think he said five or six people with it. Wow. I didn't even know that. Wow. I didn't know. I heard this recently from Dave Campania, but he was saying that even if you, if like, a family member owns a home already, you can't even qualify for the DREAM program. I they, just don't believe in what it's doing. They did make it more uh, restrictive this yeah. time around because the money went so yeah. fast the last time. It's cr- yeah, it's yeah, crazy it, was, it came and went so quickly. Yeah, like Before matter, people yeah. even weeks, got yeah. to know about it or got pre-approved, it was already But they depleted. take something like 20% of the equity when you sell, it's a, right? It's an equity share, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like if you, but that's a lot of it's money. It's like if you were investing in a house and you asked me for cash and I put in 500000 and you put in 100000 wouldn't you give me an equal percentage of the profits relative to what I invested? Break it down like yeah, that, see, and it's like, just yeah. like the Biden oh. thing. It's like it, it's going to work for certain people who yeah. I think see themselves in the property forever. Yeah, like, or, don't, or, don't or sell otherwise you're need, couldn't yeah. get into a house exactly. because the down payment's yeah. too high what on a, the market. Then it's mm-hmm. like those those BMO homes that are over here in Camel and stuff. Remember, we used to get those leads. <clears throat> they would lock it in. <clears throat> you had to be locked in for forty years. Dude, I just had my client that's, that's selling actually, in San Mateo. Yeah. She waited. Yeah, thirty years. And you can't. So that's what I'm saying. So those people who take advantage of that, it's like. You know, I guess we're going to be in there forever with the family who's going to go to that school district. Yeah. You're and just for older. people watching, what that means is your home BMR can only stands for below market rate, mm-hmm. and you can only appreciate X amount, which is like what three to five percent a year. It's next to nothing. Yeah, yeah. but you own something, mm-hmm. but you can stay there long enough for the program to go away, and it's just like a regular resale. Thirty years, you have mm-hmm. to stay in the house for thirty years, which is great. Yeah, and for the buyers who are listening, it's not a, as easy and as quick as you think. There's a lot of restrictions on it as well. Mm-hmm. You have to, you gotta go qualify. Through. There's a waiting Multiple list. Qualifications. Yep. The waiting list, the one in Campbell, I swear to you, lasts for seven months, and the lady said that they take a hundred people per weekend to go and walk through it, and then they start to like weed them out into yeah, a and it goes to funnel. residents of that city first and all mm-hmm. that good stuff. And it's yeah. a lottery system mm-hmm. if there's multiple <coughs> people. Have you guys ever sold one? <coughs> yes, I haven't. I sold a house keys condo in Morgan Hill, and I got into it with house keys because they wanted the seller to let the house keys agent list it and not me, so it would stay in the program. Is and the house keys the same as the BMR? It's a BMR. Yeah. House keys is actually the most prevalent okay. here in our area because yeah, I had them in Scotts Valley. I've yeah, they're everywhere. Yeah. They're everywhere. They're, they were the ones on Bersano selling. Yeah. Speaking of government, I'll, I'll uh, share my last topic of the podcast, and then I'll move on. But I think this warrants a little bit longer discussion. The Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, right? I mean, there's different reserve banks, and then there's the big feds. The Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Richmond issued a research paper um, recently claiming that real estate commissions are too high. And what they are recommending is that the buyer side commission go to a service based model, meaning buyer goes and looks uh, houses on Zillow and they say, hey JD, uh, (laughs) we want you to show us a house. JD says, okay, I'm gonna show you a house and my rate is $100 for every house I show you. So like a Redfin. Okay, and then JD, we want you to write a contract. Okay, my fee is $3,000 to write you a contract. They believe that a service-based model, specifically for a buyer's agent, would be better and save uh, consumers money and keep the prices of homes down. So my question to you is, what do you guys think about that? And then I'll offer my thoughts too. I, I love that because I had a client that 
told me this exact thing about two and a half years ago and for a year we didn't get any houses i showed him over 50 houses and i told him look it doesn't matter if i sell you the first house or the hundredth house i will get paid whatever the seller's agent has negotiated and whatever they're offering out mm -hmm. on a property that we don't even know if it's on the market that you're going to buy right now uh, and and he's like, what if I paid you, you know, a thousand dollars for every home you worked on for me? And I worked on 50 plus homes for him. <laughs> so imagine how much he would have paid me up right. front for all of those homes. Uh, whereas I got paid probably half of that, if mm -hmm. not less, after all those splits and taxes right. and everything. Yeah, sure. So if I actually average it out, I got paid probably minimum wage for all the hours that I've put into it. Mm -hmm. But I oftentimes think about, you know, what if I had agreed to, yeah. the, to, the, to the first former idea that he had? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I love that. I mean, it would be great, and we would probably get paid a lot more <laughs> with some of our clients with that, with that strategy. All right, that's an interesting take. Aaron, Ben? I, I, think that's an, I think that's an interesting take, too. I think, because I, I have a client who I've been showing homes in Santa Clara for, kind of like the same thing. <laughs> yeah. It's gotta be 50 plus homes. Um, I feel like one, it would light a fire under the, the buyers, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit like, what are we just gonna keep paying me to see at homes? You're not gonna be a serious buyer, not gonna write a serious offer. Right. Um, but I also think there will become a part where this the buyer will, won't as trust you as much anymore. They'll start to go to open houses on their own. They'll start to do their own research to try to save them money. And mm -hmm. then you're gonna get caught just writing offers and going over disclosures and it's like. Okay, but think about this. So, so one, I think that while the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond might be well-intentioned, they're completely missing it, right? Because sure, you could pay JD to open up doors and to write a contract, right? Seems good. Okay, well then what about, um, can you help me interpret the disclosures? Mm -hmm. Let me know what should be fixed. Okay, well that's another charge. Mm -hmm. Oh, do you have any vendors and can you help kind of manage that process? Oh, well that's another charge. Right, and it's you know, oh, my lender's having a problem tracking down this HOA doc. Can you help? Oh, that's another. Here's charge. the thing, though, with that, I mm -hmm. totally agree. Yeah, buyers don't even know what they need, what so they, they wouldn't know. even know what services to select, and right. it's going to end up ten times worse. I thoroughly believe that the model that we have now totally works. It's paid by the seller. It works specifically for this area. Mm -hmm. Maybe in other states, other smaller areas right. where the prices are lower and sellers aren't netting a million dollars on transactions. I feel like Fine. it keeps I feel like it keeps buyers agents too humble in a way. Like you're not just out there just showing them every single property and got like you're, well, you're yeah. basing the properties you show off of specific, like we're showing you this property because we're going to get this property. We're not just going to walk into the property and take a look at it and figure out what we like and like no, we're yeah, coming in thanks. with a serious mm -hmm. motive. Oh, I can make $100 yeah, if I show this to them. Yeah, right. exactly. So I'm going to show them 20 houses, and I don't care if they buy or yeah. not. But to Jeet's exactly. point, it does end up equaling out. Sometimes the buyers that we meet, they want to write on the house that you met them at at the open house, and other times they want to see 100 houses. Yeah. But yeah. What, it all what, averages out. What right? people forget is that it also includes our experience, right? Value. You know, yeah, yeah, the value, exactly. you know, a perfect, and the, and the tools, information, access that we still have above and beyond what consumers have. Because consumers have a lot of information these days, but we still have more. Right, we still have access to those vendors, those vendor relationships. We know the inspectors, the appraisers, all of that stuff. You know, it's similar to um, I had one of our handymen come over and build some shelving for me in the garage, and literally the order consisted of twenty-one two by fours and a box of two and a half inch screws. I bought the plans online; they were ten bucks. I gave them to the guy. I said, "How much are you going to charge me um, to build this?" And he's like, "Well, I'm going to charge you three hundred fifty bucks." I was thinking like, damn, that's a lot of money, right? But then when you think about it, one, it's his the experience that his has that he has on building. It's the tools that he brings because you need a chop saw, a table saw, a hammer, a screw gun. You know, it's all of those things. Yeah, it may have only taken him two hours, and he got paid, you know, whatever it was, 175 an hour. But it's his experience because if I would have tried to do it, I'd have to buy or rent the saws, right? You know, get the hammers, all that other. Figure it's out protecting the plans. your liability. You're not going to get her doing any of this. And you're going to do it right the right. first time. You're not going to have to do it twice. Yeah. Like, so, so I, you know, and this just goes back to my point where I think, uh, you know, Aaron was saying this too. Is like a lot of times buyers don't know what they don't know, and so they commoditize what we do, especially on the buyer's agent side. Mm -hmm. They think, oh, all you did was show me a house, write an offer, got accepted, now you get a paycheck. 
Mm-hmm. There's so much more to that. The amount of time you guys spend researching comps, neighborhoods, the amount of experience that you have on neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Some buyer that's moving from Malpitas to Willow Glen or to Cambrian has no knowledge of the neighborhood where you guys are in those areas mm-hmm. day in and day out. Yeah. And let's also, make it very, very simple. If it was super easy, people who get their real estate licenses would stay in real estate. Yeah, we make it look easy because we know what we're doing, right. but it's not easy. Yeah, yeah. and it's a lot rate of, is so high. And the only way you can learn is by practicing with clients, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? How many people do they get a lead and they're like, "Hey, they want to sell. What do I do?" Yeah. It's like, "What do you do? Well, give it to me." Mm-hmm. Right, <laughs> exactly. And uh, and uh, and we also get paid for what could happen or what could get go wrong, right? Yeah, like we, it's like we mitigate risk. Exactly, right? And then and when hits as a fan you want someone that that can actually guide you through yeah and not uh, only that we have errors and emissions insurance exactly. right i mean you know we have umbrella policies and and so you know we're able to protect against some of those risks as well should a mistake arise versus if you're just a buyer on your own trying to figure it out good luck well, especially when it comes to writing offers you're looking out for your best interest you're not going in there and just shooting darts at a i mean what's yeah, your favorite I mean, saying about certain agents that come in who get paid just to write offers they're always the ones to write it for a hundred grand over ask or over the highest one. Yeah. Why? Because they're just looking to get it in, get their paycheck, go to the next one, continue mm-hmm. this process. Mm-hmm. Hey, but here's my take. I'm okay. totally cool if we cut buyer's commission. Just get rid of it. The seller has no obligated duty to pay two and a half percent like the industry standard and you negotiate in your own contract what you think you should get paid. Well, and guess what? That's coming. Yeah. I mean, I'd give it as little as another year but as much as three years, and it'll be, it'll be, you know, could, we call, we're calling it right now commission divorce mm-hmm. because you're divorcing the total commission, you know, uh, between the seller you're putting it on the seller and the buyer. If you think you're worth ten grand, write ten grand. But going back to the original conversation of the buyer paying the services, how many people do we work with that are struggling and taking every last dollar they can so that they have enough reserves and enough down payment to be able to get this house? They, mm-hmm. they can't. If they wanted to see 50 houses, they can't physically pay you for all of those services and still write the offer. I mean, there's not... <laughs> You're on the same team. Why, like... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, uh, people that struggle with down payment, they'll not be able to pay another 2.5% on mm-hmm. top of that to, to the buyer's agent. Yeah, like, and, that's and not so what's going to happen? A buyer is going to go f- to listing agent, to listing agent, to listing agent, until they find a home that they like. And guess what? That listing agent, nine times out of 10, they're not going to have your best interest in mind. They have a fiduciary responsibility to that seller, not you. So all they're going to do is say, sure, you want to write an offer? How much does my seller want? Okay, and I'll bump that up by a little bit so I look good, my seller's happy. Guess what? You just overpaid for a property because you didn't want to compensate a buyer's agent. And not to mention, I think it's very strange that California still allows dual agency where you can still represent the buyer and the seller. A lot of states don't even allow that. It is yeah. illegal in a lot of states. It's and like I, it's, it's like hiring the same lawyer to fight for both parties in a courtroom. It doesn't yeah, make any sometimes sense. Sometimes it's totally fine when it's like very above board, but when you have 40 offers, it's really hard to justify why you couldn't get a buyer's agent to help. Yeah, which is why we don't do that on our team. Yeah. We'll hand it, you know, if, if I get somebody that wants me to represent them on one of my listings, I'll hand it to one of you guys. And then that way there's equal fiduciary responsibility to both parties. Mm-hmm. There, I recently ran into a uh, an offer the other day that was kind of the same way. Like, how do you trust what the what the agent's telling you? And it was mm-hmm. an escalation clause. So for you know people who don't know it and buyers don't know what an escalation clause is, you write it in there in a contract that we will go X amount higher than the highest offer you have up to this amount of number, up to this certain number. And again, I, today, <laughs> I, like, I, find that, I find that so interesting to like go in with an escalation clause in our market with no contingencies when the selling agent could just be like, okay, you can go up 25 over to 2 million. All right, our closest one in our hand is 197. You have to prove it. Right? How do, how, I mean, it's how, really how a contract. That, you have to, you show, have to it. show it. That, the other offer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Physically, like yes, here you go, like here you go, and mm-hmm. that would be written in the addendum. Yeah, it's it's in it. We actually don't use escalation San clauses Francisco here. Does a lot. Yeah, um, you know, Austin, mm-hmm. <laughs> Texas uses escalation clauses a lot. But yeah, there. I mean, I don't see a point in that here. W- why not? Why not use an when, escalation let's say, clause? Let's say there's twenty offers on a home, mm-hmm. and it's listed for one five, mm-hmm. and you know it's gonna go to one eight, mm-hmm. and you're like, okay, I'll pay. 25 up to one up to 25,000 over 18 mm-hmm. as long as you show me the highest offer mm-hmm. or like the 25 over mm-hmm. the highest offer um, why isn't that a good strategy i know why but 
Well, then if you why? Don't want, tell well, us. Because the let's say let's say the listing agent is uh, you know is writing the offer. What exactly. if I wrote the offer for you and wrote it w- in there? What if what if he's representing There's a, a lot buyer of holes and then yeah. yeah exactly. There's so many loopholes that he can get a, get a person from his office to write up an <laughs> offer exactly where he needs you to be. Yeah, over. I mean that's a, yeah I agree and with that. that. that was my but point. it's a little bit of a stretch. I mean my thinking behind why we don't use escalation clauses is because say your client G writes on my listing mm-hmm. and I'm listed at one five, you guys do an escalation clause to one eight, your clients love the home, and then I get an offer for one eight oh five, right? And you've hit your ceiling on your escalation clause. In our market, I could come back to you and say, hey G, do you wanna go one eight one five? And you're like, yeah, your clients are happy, you look like a hero. On this one, I'm like, oh, they capped out, so I'm gonna move on to the next guy, or I'm just gonna accept this offer. So I think you you miss out on opportunities too because you're giving yourself an artificial limit. Because how many times, Jeet, has a buyer told you, my max is one seven, and then you push them up to one seven one or one seven one five because what they think in their mind is a ceiling, mm-hmm. when it actually gets time to that multiple counter situation, they don't wanna lose a house for 10 or 15K. Right, that's true. Can I ask that's you true. guys something? Yeah. So you're gonna write an offer at a million dollars. Proof of funds from your buyer mm-hmm. comes in at seven hundred thousand. You guys plan on putting two hundred thousand down, like a traditional conventional loan. Mm-hmm. What do you show for proof of funds? Do you show the full amount, and then what do you show for your pre-approval letter? The exact number I'm offering. Yeah, it matches the offer price, and then proof of funds. The more, the merrier. Because I realize when you're neck and neck, they're looking at all factors, like how much money you got in the bank, what you're pre-approved for, if your lender gave them a call, uh, your contingencies, price terms, obviously. But everything matters. So the more, the merrier. I agree with G. Now you may think, well, then that seller might be more inclined to push that offer higher because they know they have more money in the bank. But I also feel if that buyer holds firm to their offer, the seller's still gonna be like, that's a lot of money down. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about appraisal contingency, Mm -hmm. you know, any of those things. So I definitely, I try to keep the pre-approval letter around um, what the purchase price is, but definitely I show as much proof of funds as I can. Yep. Which I think is another important factor of having that lender who's on board with you and able to communicate to the other side when they call to vet them. Yeah, I'm just gonna put this out there. If you're a buyer, use a local lender. Yeah, have to. Use a local lender. In our market, when there's 525 homes for sale and there's five to 25 offers on a property, use a local lender. Mm-hmm. You can refinance later with yeah. you know pocket yeah. mortgage or you know Bells Fargo or whoever you want, yeah. but <laughs> you, you use a local lender. Yeah. I have an interesting story. So I have the townhouse in San Mateo and the agents are calling me asking, what comps did you use? Which we hear sometimes mm-hmm. often, but they're literally asking me because they cannot find, find a, a recent comp. comparable sale mm-hmm. within the last two years. Yeah. So I listed it a little bit lower than our expectations, and we ended up with eight offers, 200 groups through the open house. Mm-hmm. And For every a condo si- in San Mateo. Yeah, <laughs> and every single person has a local under and has at least 20% down. Yep. So it uh, it's very interesting to see what the market does. Well, but yeah. I think the worst thing you can do currently in this market is mm-hmm. overprice. I agree. Um, okay, I so I think that was a great discussion. I do want to wrap up with one more save the date, yes. Ben. <laughs> Come on. King Kong versus Godzilla. We are hosting our first movie night of 2024. Aaron picked this movie above all the other ones. Above Ghostbusters, above Barbie Two, I don't know what 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 else the other what are the, yeah, what the other options were. Mean Girls, Mean Girls, mean girls. JD Cells Part Two, uh, but <laughs> <That sounds> like, <laughs> what is that? Another buyer? <laughs> <laughs> don't forget the Jacob Potluck movie. Wait, hold on. We're gonna talk. We'll talk about St. Patrick's Day next. Oh, Luck of the Two Irish. Days. All, All right. right, Jacob's Potluck. One more save the date. We got coming up last week of March. We have our first movie night of 2024. <laughs> Godzilla versus King Kong. Or actually, I think they're on the same team. I don't know how. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, um, look for our posts. Or if you want a free ticket, popcorn soda, swipe up. Uh, let us know you want to you want to come along. And so we love to have our past clients, friends, uh, come out and you know enjoy a movie on us. So we got that coming up this Sunday, St. Patrick's Day. Couple of options out there. <laughs> There's a Las Gatas St. Patrick's Day party. Uh, we actually have a few tickets and wristbands left for that. So if you want to come party in LG on Sunday from noon to six, bunch of Irish bands, you know, a lot of good food, all of that stuff. Um, there's that. I know Aaron is hosting a St. Patrick's Day 
Shindig. Shindig. And that's in Morgan Hill at... 5 p.m. At, oh, yeah, but where? 5 p.m.? Oh, off Cochrane. One, off off Cochrane. Cochran. Valley Vineyards. Thank you. At Valley Vineyards. Friends are invited. Former friends were invited. Okay. Clients are invited. And, and if you want to attend that, you can send them a link to purchase tickets. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Aaron always throws great high-end events. I know Sarah's going to help coordinate that, I'm mm -hmm. sure. And you know, the food's going to be incredible Thanks, off the hook. And then lastly, we've got... Jacob, our video guy, <laughs> he's having a potluck. Yeah. So, so, were you invited? I was invited. Were you invited? I wasn't invited again. I just got here, so oh, I not talked to I thought, I thought we were friends. Where's my invite? Sorry, guys. All right, guys, that's all. Take care. We'll see you next time. <laughs>